Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to this new episode of Unity the Way Forward. I'm your host, Junaid Da, and joining me in the studio is a well known, renowned Sheikh Dr. Haytham Al Haddad. We welcome to the studio once again. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, as we know, uh, Dr. Haytham Al Haddad is the managing director of MRDF, Muslim Research and Development Foundation. And you can see the website Islam 21C to see the various works and articles that are produced from this organization. In our previous episode, we talked about the Quran and the reasons why the Quran was revealed in Arabic. Furthermore, we looked at the role the Quran plays in uniting the Muslims. Uh, it was a very interesting point, Shaykh. If you could uh, further elaborate. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Nabiyyina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam al-tasliman kathira. Uh, we said that Allah jalla wa ala, it was his will to reveal Quran in Arabic. And that was mentioned in number of ayat. Inna anzalnahu Qur'anan Arabiyan. لعلكم تعقلون كتاب أحكمت آياته ثم فصلت من لدن حكيم خبير and Allah جل وعلا said as well فإنما يسرناه بلسانك we have revealed Quran easily in your tongue in number of آيات that Quran was revealed in Arabic clear now we said that Allah جل وعلا could have chosen to reveal Quran in different languages. Right. But Allah Jalla wa Ala revealed Quran in Arabic and Allah Jalla wa Ala knows that there will be French Muslims, there will be American Muslims, Chinese Muslims, etc. And Allah Jalla wa Ala obliged all Muslims to learn Quran. Hmm. And uh, they are forced to change their tongue into an Arabic tongue at least in certain uh, in certain practices or during certain times so they have to learn to learn surah al-fatiha right they have to learn some other parts of the quran they have to learn to say the dua of tashahud in arabic they have to say to learn how to say allahu akbar in arabic sami allahu liman hamida in arabic and this is a miracle Allah Jalla wa Ala is uniting all Muslims all over the world, irrespective of their cultures, irrespective of their languages, uniting them through Quran, hmm. behind the banner of the Arabic Quran. Let us be even more specific. So, this means that although there are different cultures, but there is a common culture between all Muslims, which is what? The Islamic culture. Right. In fact, you can say the Arabic Islamic culture. Hmm. SubhanAllah. The Arabic culture, uh, does it mean wearing these types of clothes? No, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about something more important in the culture, which is what? The language. Right. As we just uh, said. And SubhanAllah, although some people are negating this idea now, uh, but it is practiced everywhere. When, uh, when you go to China, for example, you know Muslims by saying, Assalamu alaikum. Yes. And in fact, if there are non-Muslims who are using this language, you know that they have been mixing with Muslims. Right. So see the miracle? Although it is a language, but it gives sense of what? Of unity and brotherhood. Once you know that this person is sharing with you, this kind of communication it has a, so, a, a psychological impact and it has social impact even political impact that's why i think that there are some non-muslim countries who are trying to disattach their muslims from the rest of the ummah mm. the body of the ummah why? Because they know that if they disattach them from the body of the Ummah, then they can easily manipulate them and they can easily change them. Could we That's why we say, although Muslims are living as minorities, they still 
remain as part of the ummah and it is it has mutual uh, responsibilities and obligations the body of the ummah has certain obligation towards them they have certain obligations and duties towards the rest of the ummah i am living in britain or maybe somebody might say well because of my brand, uh, my background as an uh, arab person but imagine a white indigenous muslim uh, british muslim he has obligations towards palestinians in palestine right okay al muslim wa akhul muslim inna al mu'minuna ikhwa believers are nothing but brothers finish full stop same thing muslims in saudi arabia have certain duties and duties and obligations towards who towards muslims in china they mm. cannot just leave muslims in china suffering oppression of their government and do nothing no that is against uh, islamic concepts this is the first part of uh, unity uh, within uh, muslim minorities, minorities that we have mentioned okay so sheikh would it be fair to say that um, one possible method on how to bridge the gap and to unite ourselves um, and possibly to defend ourselves from disunity is the strengthening of, of the language. Uh, this is an interesting point, Brother uh, Junaid. Very interesting point. And here, let me take this uh, chance to encourage Arab countries to host more non-Arab speakers, Muslim non-Arab speakers, to learn Arabic. It is a duty upon Muslim countries to teach Muslims who do not speak Arabic, Arabic. So we, why, 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 why don't we have this? Uh, it is really something amazing, very, very strange, shocking, in fact. How many Arab countries do we have? Imagine if each Arab country uh, hosted a number of Muslims from different uh, countries, large number of Muslims, not just a few hundreds who are going to study in their universities. Right. No, large number. And irrespective of whether they are going to be du'at or not, da'is or not. No, they should teach them Quran. They should teach them the basics of Arabic language. If they fail to do this, they should send some teachers. Let Arab countries, Muslim Arab countries, send teachers to teach Arabic and Quran to China, to Philippines, to uh, America, etc. It is true that some Muslim countries are doing this, but we want more. It is not uh, enough. And they should not feel that they are doing them a favor. No, it is an obligation. Mm. SubhanAllah. It is an obligation. And imagine if we start doing this, don't you think that the whole Ummah will be coming together? Our hearts will be uh, joined, coming together? Mm -hmm. Of course, this is without a shadow of a doubt, is something very, very important. As we say, charity begins at home. So if we see uh, these great offerings, that will definitely bring the hearts together and it will be a great introduction or a beginning for, for unity. Yeah. Um, okay. Shaykh, uh, moving on, how can Muslim minorities uh, then be unified? I mean, we see many problems uh, in the West, um, maybe in the East as well, with issues of <laughs> the most controversial of that is Eid prayer, uh, or maybe even the times of the Salawat. Um, how can we unify ourselves in these in situations? Yeah, this, uh, this is the second element that we need to discuss, which is unity among uh, Muslim minorities themselves. Right. For example, Muslims in Britain, do they have to be united among themselves? Mm. Muslims in China, do they have to be united among themselves? It's difficult for me to conclude uh, a certain answer about all Muslims in different countries. But generally speaking, unity is far better than disunity. Some Muslim countries, or some, sorry, Muslims in non-Muslim countries, they said that they prefer to be seen as disunited, but not disputing as disunited, rather than being united. It is up to 
يعني the intellectuals and the scholars in every single non-Muslim country where they have uh, يعني Muslim minorities to decide. But generally speaking, if they ha if they are united, I think they will be uh, progressing better, and uh, they will be achieving things that they wouldn't be able to achieve if they were disunited. You mentioned the example of Eid and other things. Uh, first of all, what do we mean by uniting them? Okay. In some non-Muslim countries, some non-Muslim countries ask Muslims to have representatives. So if we, as or if those minorities can have uh, representatives that represent uh, them, that is brilliant. That is excellent. Okay. If that is possible. If that is not possible, then at least Muslims should have representatives in certain areas. For example, the issue of ifta. Mm. If they can have like one mufti, who can decide on these strategic issues? Not necessarily on every single issue. And who can represent Muslims before the government? Okay. Who can support the aims uh, of Muslims? Who can even strengthen the causes, the Islamic causes? If we can have that, this is excellent. In Australia, for example, they have a mufti. Okay. And the Muslim personal law is not implemented as a Muslim personal law, but they have a set up Muslims there, they have a set up for marriage dissolution, etc., whereby it will be legally binding if it has the rubber stamp of the mufti. Okay. The office of the mufti is the uh, the, the, is the the the, uh, the 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 office of the mufti is in charge of deciding the eid of muslims and the as they say the religious holidays of muslims that is a form of unity it might not be a full unity but it is at least a form of unity okay if that can be achieved in some other Muslim, uh, sorry, if in, in some other non-Muslim countries, that will be excellent. And of course, each country has its own yani, particulars. Uh, in Britain, uh, for example, there is a body that represents most Muslims. So if we can't have just one single uh, person, one single mufti, at least a body to represent Muslims in strategic issues. We have as Muslims, although we have many sects, but we have some common things. Sheikh, just to uh, stop you on that point on the most controversial uh, topic of, of sects, uh, we're going to take a short break. Stay tuned and we'll join you in just a couple of moments. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. The Sheikh was just talking about uh, the role of Muslim minorities and unification. But then we moved on to the different sects or the differences that are present within our ummah. Uh, Sheikh, if I could ask you to continue from there, please. Yeah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We said Muslims as uh, living as minorities, they should unite themselves as much as possible on strategic matters, if they can have representatives, either individuals or bodies, to represent them, irrespective of, of the differences that they have, irrespective of, of the sects they have. And we have, uh, we will see maybe in some future episodes, that although we have sects within Islam, we have some common things. Even if we don't have some common things, some Muslims living as minorities 
they should consider uh, certain rules that might not be applied in, pure, in Muslim countries. For example, Muslims living as minorities, they might overlook some of their differences, some of their aqeedah differences mm. when they talk to the outer society, when they talk to the non-Muslims in order to be seen as united and in order to further their causes. Let me give you the example of Eid. Okay. Uh, in any non-Muslim countries, we have different school of thoughts. Muslims have different school of thoughts. They might have some sects, real sects. We say to them, at least let us unite on Eid. And even I proposed that if we, can, if we can't unite on one day, let us unite on two days. Okay. You know the issue of moon sighting mm -hmm. and whether we should go for calculation or we should go for observant, uh, sorry, uh, moon sighting, naked moon sighting, or whether should we should go for the sighting of Mecca. Okay. Difference of opinions. I said, if you can unite and give up some of these differences in order to be united and to have one or two days as official holidays, that is excellent. In fact, you know, Sharia in this particular issue said, mm. So it gave preference to the day that all Muslims agree on or most of the Muslims agree on over sighting, over moon sighting. Right. And this is a point that many, non -Mus many Muslims are unaware of, that the first criteria is the day most Muslims agree on. It is not the individual moon sighting. So if Muslims, most of them agree on one day and an individual sighted the moon in a different day, he should go for what Muslims agreed on. Mm. Even if he wanted to go for his own individual moon sighting, that may work in certain cases, but not in all cases. And even if he wants to go for that, he should go for that on an individual capacity, secretly, not to disclose this to go against what? Against the unity of the ummah once they unite on something. So on, on the issue of moon sighting, in, uh, in non-Muslim countries, we say to Muslims who are living as minorities, you need to go for what you unite on. Right. Even if it goes against what you believe from a, juristic, from a jurisprudence perspective. If you believe in moon sighting or if you believe in calculation, but the rest of the Muslims in your country decided on something, then go for that. And that is a form of unity, although we have different opinions. So what do we do in a situation um, where I think the UK would probably fall into this category, um, where it's a split, where we are unable to say that the majority is here and the minority is there. There is a split between the two decisions. Yeah, the, we need, this is one of the, uh, the reasons why we are calling for unity, because this split causes real split between Muslims. Mm. And we came across certain situations where some families, half of the family is fasting and half of the family is celebrating their Eid. We want to remove this. So we say that Muslims should be united at least on these things, although they might not be uh, major, uh, major principles However, they are major practices because they reflect the, uh, sim the, 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 symboli, the, the symbol of unity right. between Muslims, at least in front of non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. So that's why we say that Muslims living as minorities, they should keen to be united, at least in front of uh, non-Muslims. So this is, this is just an example of unity between uh, Muslims living as minorities. Take other examples on political levels. Right. In some countries, 
the, the, the government is asking Muslims their views about certain things. We should unite on our stance on these political issues. If they, if they ask us about uh, certain views regarding elections, regarding certain parties, we should have a unified opinion. Unless we, as Muslims living in that particular country, we see that it is maybe better for us to be seen as disunited. Mm. So this is unity on disunity. Okay. Okay. Which is something that it is a, a, it is a strategic decision that can be taken in certain circumstances, but unity to be disunited. In fact, it is unity because it is a, an organized disunity. Right. And an organized disunity is far better than unorganized disunity because unorganized disunity uh, leads to fighting and other consequences. But organized disunity is far better. In fact, it is unity. Right. Uh, take, take another example regarding unity between Muslims living as minority. Take the issue of Muslim personal law. Okay. When we discussed this issue, I, I remember that I was giving a lecture about Sharia and uh, Muslim personal law in Britain because it is part of my PhD anyway. So uh, that lecture was delivered in Sawas, a school of Oriental and African studies. And uh, a Chinese student asked me about different sects. She said it is impossible to have a unified Muslim personal law in any of non-Muslim countries because Muslims do not have a single authority, Right. Muslims in these countries. They don't have a single authority. Moreover, they don't have single jurisprudence. Mm. They have the, the Ja'fari fiqh, they have the Sunni fiqh, even the Sunni fiqh, they have the uh, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, Hanafi, etc. So I said to her, in fact, she was a, a female student, I said to her, let them give us this opportunity and we will deal with, with our situation. <laughs> this is first of all. Well, it, it, is, it is not that Britain or France or other non-Muslim countries, they don't want to give us this opportunity because we are disunited. Right. No, because it is a level of hostil hostility and prejudice against Muslims and they don't want to see a real Islamic presence within European uh, countries. Th this is one thing. However, even within Muslim personal law, we have so many commonalities. Right. Except with some French uh, sects, in terms of marriage, talaq, inheritance. Generally speaking, e even among sects, uh, there are some common principles. Now, between madahib, Muslim personal law is very, very uh, sort of, uh, you, you can say, unified. Mm. Uh, inheritance, among all madahib, 90% of rulings regarding inheritance law uh, is the same, among all madahib. Okay. There are some minor differences uh, in issues regarding marriage, talaq, uh, the, the common ground is far bigger than what we disagree on. So, uh, in, in terms of Muslim personal law, why don't we, as Muslims living as minorities, be united to achieve kind of official recognition for the Muslim personal law within the judicial system? Right. And if we were able to achieve this, this is a great victory for Muslims living as minorities. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because we are disunited, we fail to achieve this. I don't know of any country where Muslim personal law is officially recognized as part of the uh, personal law in that country. Okay. Even in India, even in India, 
Muslim personal law is not officially recognized. It is recognized um, unofficially among uh, Indian Muslims. Thank you, Sheikh. Um, just like to come, we're coming to an end here. Uh, we talked about personal law and how this is a stepping stone to success and how it brings us closer to unity. In our next episode, we will look at the proofs and the uh, importance of unity in further detail. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Many errors have been made throughout our moving lives. It's time to seek forgiveness and do that which is right. Then only can we see between this you and me the glory of Islam and its endless beauty. No matter where you're from, no matter who you are, when it's time to leave this world, we'll all return to beauty. No matter Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to this new episode of Unity the Way Forward. I'm your host, Junaid Da, and joining me in the studio is a well known, renowned Sheikh Dr. Haytham Al Haddad. Welcome to the studio once again. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, as we know, uh, Dr. Haytham Al Haddad is the managing director of. We have revealed Quran easily in your tongue. A number of ayat. That Quran was revealed in Arabic. Clear. Now, we said that Allah could have chosen to reveal Quran in different languages. Right. But Allah revealed Quran in Arabic and Allah knows that there will be French Muslims, there will be American Muslims, Chinese Muslims, etc. And Allah obliged all MRDF, Muslim Research and Development Foundation. And you can see the website Islam 21C to see the various works and articles that are produced from this organization. In our previous episode, we talked about the Qur'an and the reasons why the Qur'an was revealed in Arabic. Furthermore, we looked at the role the Qur'an plays in uniting the Muslims. Uh, it was a very interesting point, Shaykh, if you could uh, further elaborate. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. We said that Allah jalla wa ala, it was his will to reveal Quran in Arabic. And that was mentioned in number of ayat. Inna anzalnahu Quranan Arabiyan. La'allakum ta'aqilun. Kitabun uhkimat ayatuhu. Thumma fussilat min ladun hakeeman khabir. Uh, and Allah Jalla wa'ala uh, said uh, as well, فَإِنَّمَا 